Thank you. I'd like to uh, thank all of you for coming. And I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here. I, I should say I did extensive computations before I came, which indicated that there would be many meters of snow and I would have a wonderful time skiing. Uh, and usually when I try to make connections to practical reality, uh, they fail abysmally. Um, but I, I came well prepared nevertheless, and I, I'd, I'd like to show you that. Um, in fact, uh, this uh, demonstrates something that the administration of the laboratory at Brookhaven always likes to emphasize, and that is despite it being a lab where there have been many, many great discoveries, uh, you, you may not know that the Yang and Mills did their work on the uh, and the Billy and Gage theories there, one summer in 54, the J side to the astonishing results from heavy ion collisions at Rick, that uh, the lab administration likes to emphasize that safety comes first. So, <clears throat> I'm uh, well prepared for my talks. And uh, so, you know, if I uh, happen to fall off of the uh, podium, I'm well prepared. So um, I, I could go on, for those of you who know Holger Nielsen, I could do my Holger Nielsen impersonation. He's a brilliant physicist at Copenhagen who's mainly known for the fact that, like many games, he bikes into work and he sometimes forgets to take off his bicycle helmet. I wasn't prepared for this one. Okay, anyway, what I'd like to give you is a series of talks, and in the first two, I, I really hope you get something out of it. I understand that uh, when we get it. Okay, let's go move it. But I think you're pretty well hearable, so. You think so? Yes. Yeah. I, I, I think. So you can take it off. That's what I mean. I can take it yes. off? Yes. You think so? Um, the, the first talk is going to be upon chiral symmetry, and the second talk at deconfinement, and the third talk upon marriage. You, you, you might think, well, that doesn't make any sense. This is a gauge theory. You should start with deconfinement. That's the fundamental feature that gives us QCD. But I'd like to start with chiral symmetry because the degrees of freedom that you're familiar with, pi ions, k ions, and the like, are very well known. And also because I'm going to use it to uh, uh, teach or remind you of some features of phase transitions that if you're not familiar with, hopefully by the end of the talk, you, you, you should decide are completely trivial and uh, well, well understood, because they're really <coughs> fundamental features of why we think some transitions are first order, why some transitions are crossover, and the like. So, what, I, what I'm going to do is first of all remind you of what we uh, know about flat play with chiral symmetries, what the, uh, these symmetries are in a very elementary way. And then I'll go on to consider the case of two flavors, where we believe that finite transition is a second order transition. And then to go to the case of three flavors, where because of what are known as cubic terms, that it, it's at least in the chiral limit, you're bound to get a first order chiral phase transition. So these first three sections are really things that are, are very textbook and well they might bore the experts, hopefully uh, will be illuminating to those who are just coming to the subject. And then in the last section, I'm going to tell you about things which uh, now Francesco Giacosa, who's here, uh, was really one of the first people to emphasize, and that is that the role that tetraquarks can play in the chiral phase transition. This is recent work which Vladimir Skokov and I did, and um, 
it, it, it's not clear, we'll, we'll make some qualitative headway in these predictions, um, but it's a more recent research, and it was just something that I thought was a lot of fun, and that we had a lot of fun doing. Okay, so, is that, can you turn just these lights off? Yes, that off? Just behind you. <laughs> oh, okay, is that too dark? Well, I'm going to study you can fall asleep if you want to. <laughs> okay, so, it, this is just a graph, okay, so this is QCD, this is the graph, this is, is that what? Oh, oh, my batteries have died. Oh, that's, I even checked. Oh, wow. Do you have another one? Yes, we do. Don't worry, we have to pick for some. Mm Space time. In Euclidean space-time, 
you simply have to define the trajectories to behave in this way in order to be consistent. So it's somewhat more confusing. It's clear in the Kowski space time where it's clear that there's just, just this gamma knot. And so um, that's why things get flipped. So what we can do then <coughs> is we can take the original quark Lagrangian that's just uh, Q bar covariant d slash times Q, and we can insert a sum of projectors, PL plus PR. Well, that's just equal to 1 since it's 1 plus or minus gamma 5. Then we can take each of these projectors and square it. So this is PL squared and P right squared. And then take that projector and move it through D slash. So here if we take PL, we move it through D slash, it becomes PR. And we get P left times quark, that should be quark again on the right. And similarly to the right-handed projector, so what we end up with is a sum of q bar left times d slash times q left. So this only involves left-handed fields, and similarly for right-handed fields. And this is the basic origin of chiral symmetry, that we thought we just had a simple isospin symmetry, and in fact we have a larger symmetry. The mass term is not invariant under this because then there's no anti-commuting. I take q bar q, it's the sum of the two projectors, but now, again, because for q bar it's switched, this is going to mix the right and left hand of the And so this breaks the chiral symmetry. So <clears throat> what we have is if we don't have masses, this is invariant under SU left cross SU right symmetry, and if we have mass, that symmetry is broken. And what we believe to be true is that that's what we have in QCD. We have, if we have NF letters, we have an SU left cross SU right symmetry. So each of these fields rotates by an SU left matrix, that's what we can call it a left handed or right handed. So that's a fairly straightforward generalization of the usual isospin symmetry. We just have to <coughs> notice that there's this left handed index or right handed index. Okay. It also is necessary to keep track of the phases. Remember, I said before that we can rotate all the quark fields in the, by a phase. In this case, it's rotating the left and the right-handed fields in the same manner. That's a vector-like symmetry. However, now since we have left and right-handed fields, we can rotate them in an opposite manner. That is, we can rotate the left-handed fields in one way and the right-handed fields in the opposite way. This is a different symmetry. This is what's known as the absolute one symmetry. And I'll describe to you uh, shortly the physical implications of this. But um, it, it does play an essential role in the chiral symmetry of QCD. It's basically what makes the eta prime happen, or the breaking of this symmetry. The usual U1 symmetry of quark number we can ignore, certainly at a non zero temperature and at a zero. Uh, core chemical potential. If you're at non zero core chemical potential, this can also be broken by a color superconductivity, but we don't have to worry about that for now. But if we have massless quarks, we start with this whole SU left cross SU right cross U1 cross absolute U1 symmetry. And if the non zero mass is generated dynamically, then this is broken spontaneously to an SU vector symmetry of the number of letters cross U1. So you break both this SU left cross SU right and the absolute. Now, the absolute U1 symmetry is very interesting uh, dynamically. It's not actually a symmetry of the full quantum theory, it's a symmetry classically, but because of topological fluctuations, because of 
the axial one, if you compute this correctly, you find that it's proportional to the product of the field strength and its dual. This trace of the GG dual is uh, non-zero due to topological fluctuations, such as instant times and the like. And this gives rise to the breaking of axial G1. Now, the main thing that we don't understand about the chiral transition, we know, as I'll show you, if this term is large, then you break the axial U1 symmetry, and that seems to be true because the eta prime at zero temperature is a very heavy state. It's not like pi and the bands or the eta. At high temperature, you can show that the kind of fluctuation <coughs> that produce this symmetry break um, is suppressed dynamically. And in fact, you can show it vanishes by a very high power of the temperature, something like 1 over t to the 7th in the pure gauge theory, and 1 over t to the 8th or 9th in uh, QCD. So eventually, these the breaking of this symmetry completely turns off and we can ignore it. Whether or not that's true by the uh, chiral phase transition is something that we can only understand from uh, numerical simulations on the lab, such as all of Kasman talked about uh, yesterday. So what is the conclusion now of that specific? <coughs> I'll, I'll, I'll discuss that okay. later. It, it's still a very... Uh, Confused okay. situation, I think. Okay, thank you. <coughs> okay. So let's start with the simplest <coughs> example of two flavors and consider the simplest possible model of kind of symmetry breaking that you could imagine. So first of all, consider a field phi naught, which I'll call the sigma for historical reasons which is q bar q. So this is the thing that we expect to get an, an expectation value. And then we'll take something that in terms of the quark field looks a little off. It's an anti-quark. This is a flavor matrix times gamma 5 times q. You might say, why do I take this? And I'll show you later. I'll consider models where you have all possible <coughs> combinations of quark bilinears. Uh, this is a field with a spin parity of 0 plus, and this with 0 minus. But there are three of these for two flavors, so there are three poly matrices. <coughs> and what I'm basically doing is taking the representation of SU2 plus <coughs> SU2 and writing this as an O4 vector. And it's just simpler to deal with this as a vector for this case. For three flavors, uh, there isn't a Similar trick that one can do when one has to write down a uh, more complicated uh, matrix model. <coughs> but what we <coughs> can then do is combine these. This is an O4 vector. And so we can write down a mass term and a uh, quartic coupling. There's no qubit coupling that we can write down in this case. There's no way we can take this vector <coughs> and form an invariant under O4. And then what one does is one makes this mass term to be negative, so the potential goes down. And let me show you. So at, at zero temperature, what we're going to take is a potential where the mass term is negative. And so the field is going to get some value, some non-zero value. And then at very high temperatures, at very high uh, values of the field, the potential goes up again. And then what you do is you expand out the minimum, you calculate, it's easy to see what the minimum is potential is, it's either zero or m squared over lambda. And then you can work it out. And what you find is that the uh, mass squared of the sigma, at this point, as you can see, well, the mass squared is going to be positive. This is a stable minimum. Uh, this is supposed to be symmetric about sigma goes to minus sigma, I'm not such a good artist. And what you can show, too, is that the uh, ions <coughs> are massless. 
And this is because, of course, of Gold's double theorem that we've spontaneously formed a continuous symmetry. You can also show that if we add a term that's linear to sigma, so this is just proportional to phi naught, that, well, you change the mass square to the sigma by a little, but the pions are now massive, proportional to this field. And this is a very good description of what we believe happens with pions. This is field H is proportional to a, uh, the bare quark mass, and it gives the pions mass. And with this, we can then understand what the uh, phase transition is at non-zero temperature. So what it is is we start with this potential that we have minus a mass term and a quarter column. This n squared is negative at zero temperature in order to break the symmetry. And we model this by saying, well, this starts out negative. It becomes positive as it becomes increasingly positive as you increase the temperature. So at very high temperature, both the mass squared and the quarter coupling are positive. So the minimum is at the origin. We restore the symmetry. And then the point is simply that at some point, this effective mass term will become negative. So what this kind of horribly drawn curve is meant to represent is a term where there's only a quartic potential. So at some point, the mass square, the effective mass square vanishes, the expectation value vanishes, and we have a point where we have the second order phase transition. We have diverging correlation <coughs> points because the mass square vanishes. And the point of what's a uh, second order phase transition. Now, there are various technicalities for the theorists that one can describe. This is in the universality class of all four. The properties of second order phase transitions are believed to be universal and are, are known directly from experiment to be so. But for most of the physics, you don't have to worry about that because it's certainly for applications to have physics is bound to be of secondary impact. The point is simply that you have the potential, it's downward, spontaneously broken in zero temperature, it's uh, monotonically increasing at high temperature, and then at some point in between it's flat. And all you have to know is the second order phase transition is where the potential flats. So this is one of the simple things that I, 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 I hope you get out of this talk. In the second order trade phase condition, you have a flat potential. Now, I argue that to describe QCD, you have to add a term that is linear in this field. And what that is going to do is the following. Well, no matter what else I have in this potential, if I have a linear term, I can always uh, zoom in on the potential very near the origin, no matter what these coefficients are. For very small phi, it's always going to look like this. Always. Simply because it's a linear term. It dominates. It's the biggest thing for sufficiently small values of the field. So that because of this, even if I have let this m squared vanish, or is slightly positive, slightly negative, whatever I do, I can never flatten the potential. I can never get a potential that looks like this to ever look like anything like that. Never. And so whatever you do, you can never flatten the potential. And what this means is the expectation value of the field is non-zero at any time. <coughs> what this implies is that the cardinal transition is always crossover in the field. <coughs> if I ever have a term that's linear in the field, the expectation value is going to vary smoothly as I go from large to small values. Now, 
That isn't quite true. If it's really strongly, well, I'll, I'll show you. This is true if it's second order. If it's first order, it depends. And I'll show you how that goes for um, three flavors. But the point is, is that if you had a second order transition, you had a linear term, it's always going to wash out the fact that the potential can't be flat. With a linear term, you can't get a flat potential. That's all I mean. There's also uh, another feature that's somewhat <coughs> and I'll mention in my third talk. Um, we think that the expectation value of phi is large at zero temperature. It's in fact proportional to the time of the A constant. The expectation value from this, if you just look at this, will vanish. Well, you have to go through some sawing that, but it, it becomes small at high temperature. And in fact, this is a problem. And we'll see that we have to add additional terms at high temperature. But that won't happen for some time. So let me go on to tell you about the complete theorem for two flavors. So before, I added a term that was like q bar q. This is the sigma meson with spin parity of 0 plus. I added pions, which was q bar a flavor matrix times gamma 5 times q. And let me add what are clearly the other degrees of freedom that I'm missing. I can make q bar times gamma 5 times q. This will have spin parity 0 minus and is associated with the eta meson. <coughs> or q bar poly q that is spin parity 0 plus and carries a, a flavor and we associate with the um, A naught meson with a mass of something like 980. These are the masses. The sigma we don't know, it's somewhere maybe 400, 500. Pions we know 140, A is 500. Okay. So now what we do is we form the same kind of field as before, but now it's complex value. It's not real, it can be complex. So one thing we can do is we can certainly take the previous model, where we take phi dot into phi uh, conjugate, so this is now, this is now a field with twice as many degrees of freedom. It's not just an O4 matrix. And in fact, what you can show is that this is invariant under O8, because that we now have four times two degrees of freedom. There are also terms that are not invariant under the full O8 symmetry, but only under O4 times O2. For example, we can take this fourth component matrix, square it, and then multiply by its complex conjugate. So that here is clearly invariant under O4, but because we're not taking phi dot phi conjugate, it's not invariant under O8. <clears throat> and then there are terms that are also invariant just under O4. And the simplest is a mass term. We can take this matrix phi, square it, so it's an O4 invariant, and then add its complex conjugate instead of multiplying it. So this won't be invariant under the O2 symmetry at all, and just under O4. Now why would we want to do this? Well remember, this O2 symmetry is essentially related to the axial to one symmetry I described previously. And what one can show is the following when you work it out. This phi is a sum of the sigma field plus i times the uh, eta, and pi ions plus i times a naught. And when you work out what this combination is in terms of component fields, what you can show is that it if you just assign properly, then it makes the eta meson happy. And that was the original understanding that a hook provided of the axial anomaly that needs to come from similar configuration will push the eta up as we need. The eta is much heavier than the pi. This is a model without k -ons. 
than toe behavior should be hidden. What it also does, which is less well appreciated phenomenologically, is it pushes the sigma back. And th this is something that one can show is true generally. I have tended to term, in, in this model, the ions, <coughs> if you work it out, are actually massless. We have, this model has an exact symmetry of all four. And so if you work out what the symmetry breaking work is like, ions are massless. But you can show that um, the pions will remain massless. But if you go ahead and you add a term linear in sigma in compute, you can show that you get the following relation. This was first derived by Huck in the 80s. That the mass splitting of the masses squared between the eta's and pions has the opposite sign between the a naught and the sigma. That is, as you can see directly from this relation, the not only pushes the eta up, but it also pushes the sigma down. So you, you said before that the mass of the sigma is not really well known. Uh, really, but I mean, if you take this uh, relation rigorously, and since the other masses are rather well established, so you have a kind of uh, prediction for the value of uh, sigma. Yeah, it'll be, it'll be very broad. You're asking me what it is, and it's something like 400. Okay. So from that we get to 400. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. What is the significance of the different uh, signs in the anomaly? Yeah, it, it also, well, yeah, they, uh, thank you for the question. It, it pushes the sigma down and the pi down, and it pushes the A naught. I mean, it's just the way it works out. I mean, it's not obvious before you work it. For example, you could have, I didn't stress it, but I, I've written this with a minus sign. You could say, well, how do I know that's a minus sign? Why shouldn't it be a plus sign? Shouldn't that be a minimum for the maximum? It won't affect the minimum for the, oh, you mean for sigma? Yes, it could. In that sense, I'm assuming that the thing that condenses is the channel of zero plus. It could be you could adjust the signs such that the minimum is in the uh, zero minus channel. That is, the eta condenses instead of the sigma. The problem with that would be that in QCD and vacuum that you would spontaneously break parity. And we don't believe that QCD will spontaneously break parity in vacuum. But, but the signs in, in the answer to your question, it, it is funny, it's not obvious. And you'll see for three flavors, it's even less obvious. But it's just one of those things you have to work out. I, I don't have some answer to that question. Okay. <clears throat> so, the question then is, is this term, as I said, this term is actually temperature dependent, and we don't know how the temperature dependence changes. In particular, if this term is small by the chiral phase transition or large. Okay. Well, that's for two flavors. Let me then go on to consider the case of three flavors. Unless there's any other questions? Um, in your solution, uh, how do you define those masses? So, because it cannot be treated as a coefficient that, uh, uh, in that diagram because masses are just poles with a propagator, yeah? And that, uh, that is, that, uh, then we have the interplay between temperature, we have a different situation, in we have finite temperature field theory and, and uh, in vacuum, so it's, it's, uh, I think it's a subtle day. Uh, I, absolutely. I, I'm simply dealing with things at the level of tree level in the Lagrangian. But 
but clearly what we want to talk about, as you say, are the positions of Paul's and propagators. Yes, because this is it. <coughs> if the transition is of second order, I think you can make a clear statement that you should see uh, zeros in the uh, inverse propagators, and that should be a long time statement. Mm -hmm. <coughs> For the sigma, if it's a broad meson, that, then it's a real question as to what you mean. If you've yeah, yeah, been looking it's at it's some pole off the physical <coughs> sheet that has a broad resonance. On the other hand, if you really are close to a second order transition, even if the sigma is broad at zero temperature, uh, the sigma and the pion will become nearly degenerate, and at some point, the sigma should become a narrow resonance. And, and that's something which people have discussed, uh, presumably some people in the room here, uh, phenomenologically, that might become of interest. That so would be a kind of a point. Mm -hmm. If I, if I want to calculate this coefficient L sub A squared from QCD, I need some topological objects, I guess. So, did this, uh, did anybody calculate this quality, let's say, in the inside of a gas model or something like that? Uh, this coefficient, you can compute at high temperature, and, and, and that's good enough. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Okay. Just the uh, coefficient of exactly basically this term. I should also mention, I, I don't know, I apologize for listening to the talk yesterday, because Mark discussed this, but um, what the lattice has done, um, it, it would to actually calculate this term directly is difficult from the lattice, but what the lattice has done is look at basically this kind of quantity indirectly and look at susceptibilities, not for the, the <coughs> sigma and the eta are isosingular channels, they have disconnected contributions, and that's difficult to look at. What they looked at is the difference in susceptibilities between the pion and anon channel. That has no disconnected contributions. And the in answer to uh, uh, your question about is the anomaly large or small, they seem to find that the difference in the susceptibility between pions and a naught is large at the chiral phase transition. And that's why I, uh, I would normally say that the uh, effects of the spontaneous breaking of axon you want are large at the chiral transition. However, I'll, I'll mention at the very end, uh, we also believe that for three flavors, that the chiral transition should eventually be a first order for uh, in the chiral limit. And that region that we uh, that the lattice finds a first order transition just gets smaller and smaller. And they haven't seen it at present. And that's very hard to understand. <coughs> I haven't explained for the rest of you, why you expect the anomaly to drive the chiral transition first order. I'm going to do that in a few slides. But the region where we expect it to be first order is now smaller than pion masses of 50 and mm. And it's not easy reconciling the two, that these susceptibilities, which are manifestly due to axially one breaking, is consistent with this small first order transition. Did that answer your question? It, 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 it's actually, it, it's a very clever way because the defining top, you, you might say, oh, you just look at the top, topological susceptibility on the lies. But that's difficult to do for technical reasons. Okay. Are there any other questions? Okay, so let me go on to consider uh, three flavors, and here I, I can't be quite as sloppy as I was with two flavors. And so you, you 
you have to write down, this is the fourth Lagrangian again, we can decompose it with the left and right handed fields. <coughs> Classic, we have a global flavor symmetry, so we have you left and you right are SU3 matrices, so they have determinant one, and that's not going to matter. If you have SU3, what matters is that the determinant of that flavor matrix as unit determinant. And the axle U1 symmetry will define by rotating the left-handed quarks in one way and the right-handed quarks with the opposite side. The, what we then do is take these uh, quark fields that have carry both color, denoted by a capital letter, and flavor denoted by a little letter. We form them into a color singlet. So we take a right-handed quark and a left-handed end-up quark. And then if you look at these transformation properties, we've defined this field to transform like e to the i alpha, where alpha is the axial symmetry. And so this is kind of going right on the left and the left dagger on the left. As I said, this axial U1 symmetry is broken dynamically by instantons and other fields. In fact, it's broken to a Z3 symmetry. That's not quite so obvious. The easiest way to see that is actually to say, well, what if I take determinant of 5? If I take determinant of 5, <clears throat> then under a, the left-right rotations of the Product determinant of A times B is determinant of A times determinant of B. So the left-right transformations aren't going to change. But if I multiply a field by a constant phase, what happens is that I get the, if it's a 3 by 3 matrix, I get three such phases. So it's either the 3 I alpha. And this is the Z3 symmetry. If I take alpha to be 2 pi i over 3, this is going to be equal to 1. And as I said uh, before, this symmetry <coughs> is always broken dynamically, but it's to a very good approximation of storing at high temperature in the dilute instant time gas model. You can show this is uh, restored like 1 over t to the 7 in the pure gauge theory to 1 over t to the 9. Okay, <clears throat> so let's now uh, write down the possible sigma models we have for chiral symmetry. And I'm going to go through things uh, explicitly. We now have to take phi to be this 3 by 3 complex matrix. So it has in general 18 degrees of freedom. And let's first of all look at how it transforms under this SU3 left cross SU3 right, cross axial U1 symmetry. And I'll consider a special case. I just want to go through this because <coughs> sometimes when you hear people talk about symmetries, it's a, you, you might wonder, well, how do you know what the symmetries are? And the easiest way is just to take a simple example. For example, uh, take the field to be diagonal and look at the invariants that arise. So I'll take phi 1, phi 2, and phi 3 to be some complex numbers. This is in general a complex 3 by 3 matrix, but a diagonal matrix is all we need to understand the symmetries. So for example, if I take the trace of phi dagger times phi, what am I going to get? Well, I'm just going to get phi 1 complex times the square plus phi 2 complex times the square plus phi 3 complex times the square. If I took all components, I clearly get something that's invariant under O18 because I have 18 degrees of freedom. I can then take the square of this matrix, and I'm going to get the squares of the complex conjugates plus a cross, plus various cross points. Ooh, this battery is dying too. Well, I don't know. Well, a pointer, very good. Okay. So if I wrote 06, this should be 018. So if I write this out, oh, this is 06 if I only consider this. Yeah. So if I write just these terms, then I have something that's invariant under 018. 
And then there's clearly one other important term that I can enter. I can take trace of phi dagger phi complex conjugate squared. Now, if I do this, what am I going to get? Well, I just, this is the diagonal matrix, so I multiply phi times phi conjugate is phi 1 conjugate times phi 1, and then I just get all of these terms, these three terms, complex conjugate squared. And that's all I get. I don't get any cross terms. So the terms that I have here, just from squaring this trace, I no longer get. And that's how you can see it's not invariant under OE2. It's just invariant under this small asymmetry of SU3 left cross SU3 right. OK. So these are the only terms I can write down that involve two or four powers of the field. And there's one other term that I can have, as I said, I can take determinant of phi. Because determinant of phi is going to be invariant the SU3 left plus SU3 right doesn't change. And then in this case, what am I going to get? Well, this is determinant of the diagonal matrix. I get phi 1 times phi 2 times phi 4 to 3 plus complex conjugate.
why it's not people to see. You have to go through and work it out. It's not obvious. It, it, it could have been. Yeah. No, it, it's not obvious. I, I mean, one reason you can understand it is that this is the thing that's getting in that. So you're treating that in a special way. And so when you work out the potential, it's not going to be the same. I mean, basically what you know, if I assume the SU3 symmetry, these masses have to be the same. These masses have to be the same. But there's nothing that ties this mass to that mass. But, um, yeah, it's not that good. Okay. <coughs> if, if you wish, <coughs> since this is a singlet, there's no reason for it to mix with these things. So it could be. It doesn't mean it is, but it, there's no symmetry <coughs> that relates to masses of the two states. In any case, and I'm going to give this as a homework problem, you can show that as for two flavors, the masses satisfy a relation like that, the two flavors that, as the anomaly pushes the A to prime up, it pushes the six down. And this is the mass of this singlet state. <coughs> okay. Let's go on to then consider what the chiral transition is like. So all I'm going to do is take this expectation value where it's diagonal. The H field is diagonal. And put it into this Lagrangian. And what happens is that since it's a diagonal matrix up to various constants, you have some mass term. <coughs> this should be cubic. This should be pi naught cubed and a quarter cubed. And the basic point is then the following. Now, I'm not adding a linear term. So, at, what this term does is it skews the potential between the left and right hand of parts of, of the uh, potential. So, because the cubic term, say it's zero temperature, if I choose this term to be negative, it's going to make it more negative on the right. And so we expect that the stable minimum will be phi not equal to zero. This is what the potential should look like in zero temperature. You have a negative mass term, so it starts out negative. And so you have a stable minimum on one side. What you can then show is assume that we change this mass term such that it vanishes. Well, what do we have at the point where m squared vanishes? If m squared vanishes, the potential starts out as cubic at this term. So if this has a negative side, it's very flat. It goes up on one side and then down. And you see that it can't be a flat potential. Because of the cubic term, it will never be flat, unlike the previous. Whereas for a second order transition, without a cubic invariant, you can always flatten the potential. <coughs> In this case, you can never flatten the potential. And this is one of the other lessons that I want you to remember. That was the cubic term. You can never get a second order transition. There's always going to be a, um, you, you simply cannot flatten the potential. Now you might say, you know, wait a second. So how can I get any kind of uh, phase transition? Well, the point is that what you need to do you can get a, 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 a tra transition if the potential looks like this. And what this is, is a typical potential for a first order transition. You have two degenerate minima and a barrier in between. And in order to get this, remember, this term. 
term, which should be minus y naught q, is negative. So what you have to have is, in order to get this, you have to have a positive mass term. So this is plus m squared times phi squared. So it starts out positive. Then you get minus phi cubed. So that makes the potential go down. And then eventually you have a positive quartic term, which makes it go up again. So if you balance these three things, a positive mass term, a negative cubic term, and a positive quartic term, there's clearly, I mean, it depends upon the parameters, going to be one special point at which you have the minimum is that phi to zero is degenerate <coughs> with non-zero phi. And that's a first order transition. So if that if nothing else, I hope that those of you who aren't familiar with this, ah, first order transition, two degenerate minima bump in between. And this bump is in fact related to the interface tension between the two minima. At high temperature, uh, there's again a large positive mass squared. This dominates everything, and the expectation only vanishes. <clears throat> what about break? We are close to the break. So I was just going to suggest that this would be a good point to stop. Very good. Okay. 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 Okay.